is a TSD Broadcasting iNews Special Report. This is Shep Altschuler, publisher of Timesharing Today. We conducted today's interviews shortly after Hurricanes Harvey and Irma wreaked havoc in the U.S. and across the Caribbean, and before Hurricane Maria formed and became a Category 5 storm and made landfall in Puerto Rico, bringing mass destruction to this U.S. territory. We have also seen the aftermath of the massive earthquakes in Mexico, adding to our concerns about extreme natural disasters. The intensity and frequency of these extremely dangerous natural disasters have a ripple effect on all of us. Chances are someone you know has been affected. I decided to reach out to today's guests because they are familiar with two areas that have a fairly high concentration of timeshare resorts that suffered a significant amount of devastation. We will first be joined by Jeff Berger with JMB Communications, who has been for decades providing news and information about the island of St. Martin. And then we will be joined by Lee Collier, National Director of Construction with Comstruct LLC based in North Carolina. Lee has managed the renovations and reconstruction of timeshare properties in Florida, Virginia, Tennessee, and North Carolina. So now let's welcome Jeff Berger. Uh, hi, Jeff. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you, sir. Welcome. I appreciate it. I appreciate you joining us. Uh, tell us about your background and involvement with St. Martin. I first went down to St. Martin in 1978 with New England Life at a conference. I was working there. I was doing field publications and field communications. And I fell in love with the island but had no time to see it. So the next year, we went back on a charter and stayed at Summit Resort. Loved it and uh, have been going back every year since. Talk a little bit about uh, your current involvement with communications. I have a, uh, a marketing company, and uh, in uh, 1992, 93, I was setting up a website for my company, and I wanted to put up an eclectic collection of writing samples. So I had written something before about St. Martin, just for one of the local newspapers, and so I put that in among the articles that was on my website. I also was doing work for digital equipment, and at the time, Alta Vista was an internal search engine within digital. And they said, okay, why don't we know what you're doing? Why don't you put that information on, uh, on in Alta Vista? So when Alta Vista went public, I was uh, the only technology marketing writer, which is what I was doing at the time. And I was also the only website about St. Martin, the, the first one in the Alta Vista search engine. And uh, I started to get calls from friends down there. Al Wadi, for example, at the old Turtle Pier restaurant, and he said, people are coming in saying that uh, they heard of uh, me on your St. Martin website. I didn't know you had a St. Martin website. And my response was, I didn't know I had a St. Martin website either. So that's the way it started. And I developed that uh, writing sample into a separate site, which is called EverythingStMartin.com. It's now had over 5 million visits, and it's very popular. And, uh, you know, it just uh, the, kind of the beat goes on. I've kept uh, adding more and more material to it over the years and keeping it up to date. And it's very popular. Right. And I found it to be a very good source. And that's what caused me to reach out to you. We both have a common interest in St. Martin. So you know, I figured you would have uh, maybe a good handle on what's currently going on. So are you focused on uh, both the French and the Dutch sides? Yeah, I am. You know, it's easier to get information from the Dutch side than it is from the French. My French is not all that great, so I, you know, I, I can't read too many of the publications from there, so I rely on people from the French side to send me information, but I get, I get less information from the French side. I have plenty concerning Irma, uh, but normally I don't get as much as I do from the Dutch side. So it, it's, uh, I, w I would say probably it's um, 66-33 Dutch to French. Now, we are definitely devastated by the news of the extreme effects of uh, Irma. And what is your overall current damage assessment uh, to the island? I think the worst damage, frankly, is to the private homes of the people that live on the island. There is uh, severe damage across the island. And, you know, it, it's just one of those situations that's heartbreaking from that perspective. But the real human tragedy in this is that many local people, many thousands, are still in shelters because their homes are uninhabitable. And uh, that, that's a huge problem. The other huge problem is the obvious one, and that is that they have no place to go to work and, and earn their uh, money because uh, 
you know, many, so many places were decimated, and right now tourism is not being allowed. So it's a lot of things that need to be attacked at once. The good news is that electricity is already coming back, which is ahead of when people would have expected it to come back, especially on the Dutch side. Uh, that That's great news. Some cellular service is coming back, and Internet is coming back. UTS, the UTS tower, Chippy Tower in downtown Phillipsburg was knocked over by the storm, and that was a central tower, so that has to be fixed before Chippy service comes back. But generally, they've made quite a lot of uh, progress already. There are heavy cranes that have been brought to the island to help get lift the debris out. Uh, but again, the human toll is astronomical because of all of the hardship that the people are undergoing. Now, timesharing is a major economic contributor to the island. And how badly was the damage to uh, the various timeshare resorts on the island? It varies. Um, I've talked to uh, uh, talked to or seen reports from a number of timeshare resorts. We have a lot of information, so your uh, listeners and readers know this on our Everything St. Martin Facebook site, and that site has a number of files. The, the link for files is on the left so top left side of the page. In those files is an updated listing of reports that we have about the current status of timeshares. To answer your question directly, the impact varies depending on the resort. All resorts, it's safe to say that all resorts were damaged, some of them seriously, some of them very seriously, and uh, one of them mortally. In the case of uh, Simpson Bay Resort, as you know, they just went through a $35 million renovation, which was finished at the beginning of uh, this year, and uh, that was announced with a lot of fanfare. They were very careful about how they did that. These folks are... The uh, Royal Resorts Group is from Cancun, so they are no strangers at all. They've been in the Caribbean for a long time. They are no strangers at all to severe weather, and they built that place to withstand, uh, you know, practically anything. So they they have had obviously some serious damage. The resort is closed to get uh, repairs on that damage. But I heard from Richard Sutton, and he said that uh, they expect to be back open probably before any other timeshare resort on the island. And it would not surprise me at all to see that happen before the end of this year. On the other end of the scale is uh, Summit Resort. Summit was one of the oldest resorts. It was built in the, I believe, either the end of the 60s or the early 70s. I first went there, as I mentioned, in 1979. And it was a gorgeous resort. It had uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 chalets, many one-story chalets, many two-stories. And all of the uh, guests that were in that resort were evacuated before the storm. Ms. Patricia Evans, who was the general manager there for a long time, was in the bathroom, actually in the tub, of one of the chalets, of the downstairs of one of the chalets, along with her four-year-old son and her mother, trying to ride through the storm, kind of like a captain of a ship in a, in a, in a storm. She said she really had to stay there. It was her job. And I was texting her back and forth on, on the morning of the storm, and she said they could hear winds that sounded something like a freight train, which is not surprising. That's what people say during tornadoes. And this storm was like a four-hour massive tornado with 185-mile-an-hour sustained winds. And that is above the speed of the winds in an E4 tornado, which is 166 to 200. So what they basically had there was a tornado that lasted for hours and covered the whole island, which is why there was so much devastation. Do you have any idea how long uh, travel to the island will be restricted? I, I expect it to be uh, restricted at least until December. It could be mid-November. It depends on what kind of infrastructure is back. There are issues with infrastructure on both sides of the island. There's an enormous amount of debris to be removed. Those who know St. Martin know it as the friendly island, but there were reports of looting and some violence. Uh, so how extensive was that? Um, it, it was uh, fairly extensive at some places on the Dutch side. I heard a press report on ABC this morning that said there was widespread looting. The issue is that the, the reports that the press is giving out in the U.S., in the U.K., even in Canada, are, are news that is dated several days ago. They're giving out news as if it's current and it's not. You know, And there's been a big problem with that. When we post things on the Everything St. Martin Facebook site, we vet them first to make sure that they're coming from accurate sources and believable sources. There was extensive looting, I think, particularly at uh, places that sold electronics on the Dutch side. The Dutch side government has said,
said now that anybody who is recognizable that was doing looting is going to be found, arrested, and prosecuted. And, and that, that's obviously a big deal, but there was a fair amount of it at uh, electronic stores. There was some of it that was stopped at uh, some supermarkets. I believe Grand Marche was one, but they had guards to stop it. Uh, and you can understand, to a certain extent, you can understand people who are starving and who are thirsty wanting to get something to eat for their family. And, you know, if, if there's a supermarket that uh, is, you can walk in and, and just uh, take stuff. If your family is starving, what choice do you have? But there, there's no excuse at all for stealing television sets, even if your intent is to steal them, uh, steal them, sell them, and then try to make some money to get food. It just, it, it's beyond the pale. Uh, there, there was a fair amount of it. Uh, the Dutch Marines and the French gendarmes are stopping it, and it, it, it's, it's pretty much over. It seems like both the French and the Dutch uh, governments got in there uh, pretty quickly to get things uh, moving forward. So are you pretty much optimistic about the uh, ability of the island to recover? Yes. You know, there, there's no question about their need to recover and their uh, resolve to recover. Uh, you know, that was that was a given. I think that the, the French and the Dutch governments both did, uh, and I'm talking about the governments over in Europe, did a great job of um, scheduling and setting up and staging the things that had to come to the island because they've done it very quickly. So is the U.S. Air Force uh, in, in making evacuations. And even Royal Caribbean got involved because it has sent ships to the island to take people out and also to bring supplies. So... The, uh, the supply relief effort has been excellent. There have been some complaints from the island about the lack of distribution or the lack of water and food. The fact is that the water and food is there. It's not being distributed fast enough just because there's not uh, enough people to do it. But in, in, to a large extent, a lot of the people on the island don't know that the food is in and it's starting to be distributed because there are no communications. So that, you know, like I said, that's been a, a huge problem. Now, give us a, uh, a rundown of how uh, people, uh, our listeners, can get in touch with you, but also uh, those that are interested who want to get you know, pretty much up-to-date current events. What is, what is the best way they can go about doing that? There are three ways to do that. Um, number one, we have a website called everythingstmartin.com. Uh, that normally is a great, a great site for uh, information on the island, places to go, things to do, beaches, restaurants, and so on. We have not changed that very much just because there's been, you know, an overwhelming amount of information to communicate. What we've done is we've leveraged and uh, what we have, uh, the Everything St. Martin Facebook site, which I know you will have the URL of on your, the, the web address of on your, uh, uh, in your podcast. And that is the place to go. The, the Everything St. Martin Facebook site includes a lot of, a tremendous number of answers, a lot of information on timeshares. Uh, there is a files section in the top left, which has uh, an enormous amount of information about uh, resorts. It, it is uh, starting to carry information about restaurants that are going to be reopening and when they're going to be reopening. So to get information about all of those things, that's a, that's a tremendous place to go. Um, it's a closed site, which means only people that are members of it can see its uh, postings. So what you do is you just ask to join it, answer a couple of simple questions, and then we'll, you know, we'll let you in. And usually the turnaround on that is only a few hours to, to get into it. The third source of information is St. Martin Weekly News. Uh, we've been publishing that for, for many years, since the uh, early 1990s. And uh, so it has been around. We've done uh, more than 1,100 issues. And we've been focusing heavily on Irma and its aftermath. And you can subscribe to that. It's free. You can subscribe to it at sxmweeklynews.com. Um, that's also a superb source of information. Well, Jeff, thanks a lot. Uh, we'll definitely be in touch you know, down the road as things progress, and I uh, appreciate you joining us today. I think they're going to pro progress more quickly than people imagine, and it was my pleasure. We'll be back for our interview with Lee Collier, National Director of Construction with Comstruct LLC, after this brief announcement. Get the straight talk about the good and the bad in the time-sharing industry. Time-sharing today. And now, let's welcome Lee Collier with Comstruct LLC. Hi, Lee. Welcome to the broadcast. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Very good. Uh, tell us about uh, your background in the industry. I'm a general contractor and an 
and a civil engineer, not a practicing engineer, as I've been in the construction business for the last 40 years and uh, have been in all aspects of construction from ground up new construction to uh, what we're doing currently, which is major commercial renovations and roofing. And uh, how long have you been with uh, Comstruct? Uh, John Duda and I have been together about five years now, maybe going on six. And uh, you definitely have seen a lot of activity that's uh, relevant to the conversation today. So what do you see as the trends relative to the frequency and the intensity of these uh, really severe weather-related events? Well, I, I grew up and live in Charleston, South Carolina, and we have been subjected to major storms my entire life. Uh, it's a cyclic thing. I'm, I can go back to, you know, the 50s and 60s when we had some very major devastating storms, and the frequency has always been somewhat undetermined. Um, we, we've gone through the last 11 years, Florida, South Carolina, Georgia. I mean, we've had a few, but nothing of the intensity of what we've seen recently. I know that this is a very cyclical thing has happened before, where we've had major storms hit um, various, aspects, various geographical areas along the Gulf and, and the Atlantic coast, and then there have been quiet periods. So it's, it's really hard to say, uh, Chef, what is causing this. I mean, right now, today, we looked at two major storms that have impacted the, the coastal areas of, of the Gulf and the Atlantic, and they're three more storms out there right now, um, and one that is going from a Category 1 to a Category 2 as we speak and is going toward Puerto Rico. So it's just a very active season uh, and, and, and one that you can't predict. What do you see are the biggest concerns when dealing with reconstruction of hurricane-damaged properties? Well, that's a great question, and I think there's two or three parts to that question that you need to, to consider. Number one, any properties that have exposure, uh, we, we deal in predominantly oceanfront timeshare properties, they need to have some sort of hurricane preparedness so they can get ready before the storm hits. That's huge. And, and, and having a plan in place that your staff, or, uh, the property's maintenance people can implement or they can bring in an outside contractor to prepare the property for a storm. And in, in the case of Houston and Hurricane Harvey, there's nothing you can do to prepare for that sort of flooding and devastation that that causes. Uh, Wind-related storms like Irma that hit uh, Florida, and, and, and particularly the Keys, with that kind of devastating winds, you, there's very little you can do. So the plan needs to be twofold. One, preparation, and the second is to have a post-hurricane plan in place. Obviously, when your property gets damaged and, and, and there are massive damages like there are in southern Florida, south Florida, the Keys, Marco Island, in uh, Naples, it's hard to get the insurance adjusters there. It's hard to get contractors there. So you should have some something set up with a with a, with your constituent board, so they know what to do, who to call, what to do. It's, it's uh, like some of the projects we work on now. They contact us well before a hurricane to make sure that we can come in and and assist them after the storm happens, and we assist them with getting insurance adjusters areas that the, their particular adjusters aren't available. We bring in public adjusters, and we we are capable of doing Xactimate, which is the industry standard estimates that we can provide the adjusters to help this process along. But it's all preparation and planning and getting the work done as quickly as possible. And in and, and, and the case of water infiltration, Within 72 hours of, of um, water getting into a building, moles start to form, uh, particularly in high humidity, high temperature areas. And it's just absolutely essential that that water get, is removed as quickly as possible. And maybe, the, you know, you have to demo the carpets and the walls. There's just a lot of things that have to happen that can prevent 
you know, more damages occurring after the storm if they're dealt with concisely and quickly. Are you generally getting on site after the storm, or are you in touch with your clients before the storm hits to just discuss strategies? How does that how does that communications um, effort work? Well, we, we certainly, in some of our clients, uh, we are in touch with prior to a storm. Um, on several of the projects that we are involved in, in in Daytona Beach right now, we were there and provided some of the pre-hurricane assistance by boarding up big class areas and trying to protect the property from wind damage. We certainly have made it known to our clients that if they are, are desirous of us coming in after the storm, they need to tell us in advance um, because we have to marshal our, our workers um, and we bring them in from wherever we have them. I mean, we in Daytona, we had to bring people in from Charlotte, Outer Banks, North Carolina, and other places where they were working in order to address the issues quickly. In other cases, some of our older clients will call us after the fact, and, and if we have availability, then we certainly go to them first. Now, is there a timing issue where, you know, as far as insurance goes, that you have to wait until funding is available bef- from insurance before you can undertake any uh, reconstruction projects? No, not not necessarily. Uh, we had a, a roof blow off a high-rise. We were able to call the insurance company. They want that roof back on uh, immediately. Uh, it, it definitely want it stabilized and dried in immediately. Um, so they'll authorize that expenditure um, just we just go do it and send them a bill, basically, and able to do that. Where you have, you know, the prospect of, of additional damages due to rain. It's raining in Daytona today, and we worked on this roof over the weekend and got it dried in. So it's, they'll allow that. The other damages need to be looked at by an adjuster, and really no funds can be authorized until the adjuster and the contractor come up with an estimate, and those numbers are or uh, agreed upon by everybody involved, and then the work can take place. And, and sometimes that uh, can take some time, but I'm quite sure down in the Keys of getting a, an adjuster on site and getting a number agreed to and a contractor to start work is going to be very time-consuming. Maybe it might be months and months before these damages are looked at, particularly in these catastrophic damages where the property is basically destroyed. But the adjusters and the insurance companies want to get things rolling as quickly as possible too, to avoid further and, and more serious damages caused by delays in getting things done. Have you seen any changes in construction materials uh, and techniques uh, to better prepare properties for these uh, major events? Well, certainly in, in new construction, and particularly in Florida and in and, and any coastal areas that are subject to high winds, the the building codes have been dramatically changed over the years to upgrade materials, particularly glass and windows and um, roofing and and things that are subject to damages from high winds have been engineered to withstand those up to a certain degree. Glass is in, in these high wind areas is all impact glass, it, it has to be, be able to withstand 135 mile an hour sustained winds and it has to be able to sustain an impact from a, a projectile going 135 miles an hour. So yeah, there, there's been some great advances in building materials and it's obvious when you see it, when the hurricane passes through and, and the evaluations and assessments are done, the new buildings uh, typically are in much better shape than the old ones. And further, when you're renovating a property now, uh, and we do a lot of window replacement and roof replacement, uh, those codes have to be, you know, you have to bring those particular materials up to building code. So as you're going through these required refurbishments or reconstruction, what do you see are the trends relative to costs when, when you are embarking on new projects? Well, unfortunately, in cases like where there are catastrophic losses over a wide geographical area, building materials are subject 
their commodities basically, and they go up with demand. So cost or uh, it costs more to to repair things when you're dealing in these situations. Um, we and and then the availability of materials becomes difficult. If you have a lot of roofing damages, it's hard to get roofing materials. They have to come in from other places. But we've been pretty flat. It, 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 it's a general statement over the past five or six years since the the 2006 um, debacle with the housing industry. Um, construction costs were pretty flat up until what probably two years ago, and then when the construction started picking up again, costs started to rise incrementally, but uh, the, 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 the day-to-day costs are manageable, but catastrophic costs can get out of hand sometimes. All right. Do you get involved in uh, financing options for these resorts? We don't. We will assist the owners in, in getting financing, and it, it timeshare uh, properties, financing can become a kind of a uh, difficult thing to put in place. It takes a lot of people to make a decision. And then having a, a you know, if you're a property with a good stabilized income, it's one thing. If you're a property that has some collection issues, then it becomes quite a different thing. So um, we help, but we don't, our company doesn't provide financing. Do you think resorts have to take a careful look at the type and level of insurance and their deductibles and uh, their reserves? Is that an area that, that you you know could comment on? Absolutely. I mean, we deal with that every day. And, and of course, the time to review your insurance and your deductibles and, and the type of coverage you have is long before a storm hits. The last thing you want to find out is, when an event occurs that, that you're not covered for wind-driven rain or you're not covered for you have inadequate flood insurance or your contents aren't covered. You, you, somebody in, within the HOA of any organization uh, should be, re- you know, if they're directly responsible for understanding the insurance coverage, whether it's your general manager or, or somebody that you bring in as a consultant to make sure that you have the reserves uh, the property we're dealing with right now has a you know a six figure high six figure deductible. Um, you have five million dollars worth of losses and you've got a million dollar deductible. Do you have that million dollars? You've got to pay that first before the insurance company starts paying the bill. So it's a very important, if not the most important thing to understand is what my insurance coverage is, what my deductible is. Do I have the deductible? covered in reserves, and is my coverage adequate to take care of the total loss, roofing, interior damages, furnishings, and flood. If And flood is, a, you, know, you have very limited coverage in flood insurance anyway, but that's just really very important. I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. Now, are there any other tips besides the financial aspects that you might want to uh, offer to timeshare resource uh, in doing advanced planning for these catastrophic situations? I just think that the the board of directors and the management of each property should have that plan in place. Uh, you know, uh, the owners are, and, and the board might be from all over the United States. Um, how do, who makes the decisions on contractors, on consultants? Who deals with the insurance company? How does all this occur? You, you don't want to be doing that on the fly. You want to have a plan in place that Mr. A, a on the board is responsible and can make decisions. You have to have a decision-making process. And like I said, and, and we're dealing with this as of today on a property where the carpet was saturated in the building. I just sent a certified interior environmentalist down, and because the carpet wasn't removed immediately, we have a high level of mold contamination in the property. The decision just wasn't made in time. So I, I think the board has to understand that these things are are really important to have somebody that can make decisions. And, and uh, you know, the board members themselves might be affected by the storm and, and dealing with their own problems. So they just have somebody or a, one or two or three people that can make decisions and and move on to, to make sure you don't linger on their 
on your response time for, to the damages. Now, if any of our listeners would like to get in touch with you in Comstruck, how can they go about doing that? Well, you can call us. We have a 800 number. It's 888-661-3711. Our email is info, I-N-F-O, at ComstructLLC.com. And our website is www.comstructllc.com. Great. Uh, thanks again, Lee. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Yeah, thank you, Chef. I okay. appreciate it, too. And this concludes this TSD iNews special report. Our thoughts and prayers are with everyone who has been a victim or has endured these extreme natural disasters. If you are an owner, board member, resort manager, or industry professional and would like to share your thoughts and experience with us, you can do so by following us on Facebook or sending your articles to staff at tstoday.com. Get the straight talk about the good and the bad in the timesharing industry. Timesharing today.